Welcome everyone to our webinar today. I'm Nicole Arbuckle and I have Nate Cothran here as well. This is the first in a series of webinars we're putting together to discuss the details of our RDA services. We know your time is valuable, so this will be a reasonably short presentation. Today we're comparing our automated RDA enrichment service to original RDA cataloging using side-by-side -side record comparisons. We'll start by looking at a brief history of our involvement and research of RDA. We'll look at our current client demographics for both cataloging and automation. We'll briefly look at our 2013 RDA survey. And finally, we'll look at a few titles and compare our RDA enrichment program against original cataloging. When the Library of Congress, National Agricultural Library, and National Library of Medicine announced the US RDA test in 2008, we knew we wanted to be involved. We had our eye on the early discussions regarding RDA implementation and knew that it would have a large impact on our services and processes. We met with LC and other potential test partners at the next ALA Midwinter and submitted our name as a party interested in participating in the test. In May of that year, we were chosen to be one of 26 test partners. Along with other test partners, we met with LC at ALA Midwinter in 2010 to learn how the test would work. Then we spent the remainder of that quarter collecting RDA training documents in preparation. At the end of June, RDA Toolkit was finally made available and the last piece was in place to start the test, which began on July 1st. We spent the next few months finalizing our training plans, choosing which staff would participate, and completing any other remaining preparation. By the middle of October, we had all arrangements and schedules finalized. For two weeks in November, we trained our catalogers for four hours in the afternoons. Then over the course of two weeks, we cataloged the test sets and completed the surveys. By the end of December, we submitted our final report to LC. For the test itself, we selected an MLS manager with a lot of cataloging experience who became our primary RDA trainer. We trained two brand new catalogers and we trained two experienced catalogers. The test required that at least two catalogers catalog the common set, one in AACR2 and one in RDA. Our new catalogers handled the common set records per the test instructions. Our experienced catalogers handled the common set records differently. We wanted to eliminate variances between the records that might occur naturally if two people catalog the same item. So we had our experienced catalogers catalog their common set titles twice, once in RDA, once in AACR2. These records were not considered part of the test and were not submitted with our test results. In addition, the test required that we include at least 25 items cataloged using RDA rules from our current workflow called the extra set. We selected 25 items from our current customers for each cataloger for our extra set. These were a mix of ebooks, print, and media items. For the training, we utilized a number of materials from LC and other libraries, as well as group discussion and practice. After the test, we began further internal preparation for RDA implementation, including improvements to training materials, creation of workflows, and other documentation. Thanks, Nicole. I'm sure a lot of us remember the conversations that took place on AutoCAD during the last few years about RDA. There were vocal proponents and vocal opponents. As a vendor, we always want to provide a service our clients are interested in, so we maintained a sense of neutrality at first. Some of our clients started asking us what our plans uh, for RDA were. We realized we couldn't sit on the fence about this, so we started seriously researching policies and protocols even though some of those were still in their infancy. All through 2011, we put forth a lot of uh, effort internally into research and potential development. In very early 2012, we announced plans to our customers about our RDA service options. There was still that risk on our side, uh, since there was no guarantee that the majority of clients would even be interested in RDA enrichment. Once we decided what our direction would be, we spent the next several months getting all of our ducks in a row, so to speak, uh, with our system. 
This includes the usual refinements to processing that takes place whenever there is a major revision to the internal system code. At the same time, we wanted to provide more feedback in the way of reports to our clients. And granted, we realize that reports can be overwhelming sometimes, but our motto has always been to inform our clients and let them know exactly what transpired with our processing. Starting now, LC maintained two separate authority databases, AACR2 and of course RDA. Likewise, we mirrored that functionality on our side. It was a bit of a trying scenario to maintain two separate databases with their own updates, uh, corrections, etc. Thanks to our internal authority control listserv, we also made sure to keep our clients up to date about pending changes and policies. For instance, uh, this period was when phase one of LC's authority cleanup commenced. Approximately uh, 313,000 authorities were changed via machine process, and this was largely due to Gary Strawn's programming. The intent with phase one was to begin to make existing authorities more RDA compliant. From June to October of 2012, I was grateful to be a member of the PCC Post Implementation Task Group on hybrid bibliographic records. Part of our charge was to determine a good starting point in using machine processes to enrich non-RDA records with RDA elements. We also help steer the definition of an RDA record, which is designated as containing O4O's FLE RDA. From our point of view, uh, records lacking this data were non-RDA records, and records with other RDA elements but still lacking the O4O FLE RDA would be considered hybrid records. Now the Mayan calendar may have ended in late 2012, but the interest in RDA, both from existing clients and new clients, steadily kept increasing. The scales had by no means tipped, but it no, long, no longer seemed lopsided. It was about this time that we also started investigating authority control on non-marked files. RDA was originally intended to be used in a non-marked environment, so we recognized the need on our side to begin understanding other file structures. Phase two also began during this period. This time, Gary's programs updated 1xx, 4xx, and 7xx fields to ensure those were RDA compliant. This affected 376,000 authorities. These phases were not insignificant either for authority uh, vendors or authority customers. We had to get creative in what our clients wanted us to distribute to them. Of course, now there is a bit of trepidation regarding the upcoming phase three changes, but that's a topic for another day. Uh, our RDA enrichment service was ready in January of 2013, but we had no takers on it those first few months, and we didn't really expect any since day one hadn't yet arrived at that point. Still, we were basically biting our nails wondering whether there would be any interest in our RDA enrichment service. It wasn't until May 2013 that we saw our first client, uh, client sign up for the service. Yes, we had a good number of clients ask us what other libraries were doing, uh, but most of these institutions appeared to be waiting uh, for others to take the plunge. But not for long, as more and more clients signed up for the service, we worked hand in hand on what they wanted to see in their catalog for RDA. That kind of collaboration helped enrich our own services, yes, but we also like to think it helped other clients down the road who were coming in. Naturally, not everyone wanted to enrich as much as we offered, but it was nice to have the option to decide that for themselves. We continue to meet to this day periodically to discuss issues and wish lists to include for RDA. Sometimes we have a breakthrough, and other times it feels like we're beating our head against the wall. Uh, there are no dead ends though. We keep trying to figure out new ways to do things we thought were too difficult to do earlier. So far, all of these clients you've seen are new clients. Uh, new clients receiving RDA enrichment for the first time in their catalog. We also notice our existing clients holding off an RDA. What were they waiting for? What factors played into their hesitation? In late 2013, we sent out a survey to all of our internal customers. We asked them what their plans with RDA were. Um, in a few moments, I will briefly share some of those results. Back when Backstage purchased the authority control service from OCLC in late 2004, we also inherited many customers. A lot of those same customers have stuck with us all throughout the last decade. We wanted to reward those customers for their loyalty. So in January 2014, we offered free RDA enrichment to all existing active clients. This would prove to be a huge undertaking. 
not only for us at Backstage, but also for our clients. Logistically, it's always difficult to figure out how to export your records, wait for them to process, and then import them back into your system. These clients you continue to see on the slides, however, are still new clients. In a few slides, I'll show you how the existing clients have reacted to our offer so far. Now, at some point, libraries are going to start moving away from MARC format. When they do, we want to be ready for that transition, and we want our clients to be ready for that transition. So we've investigated adding LC authority control numbers or actual URIs into records. It's not easy to keep abreast of all the updates and changes that happen with a vendor. This was one of the reasons why we wanted to host this webinar. It's not necessarily to tout our services so much as helping to inform all of you what we've been doing and where we're going. Both automated and metadata departments have put in substantial effort to make our RDA enrichment services shine. Recently, we began some testing to see where automated uh, falls short and where original cataloging can push forward. Before we get to the actual record comparisons, let's share some brief statistics of what we've seen so far. For our cataloging, cataloging service, we noticed the majority of libraries moved their original cataloging to RDA after March 31st of last year. Very few made the change before then, primarily because they needed to finish staff training and establish any local practices. As you can see, of our current clients, only 37% catalog originals in RDA. These are mainly larger academic libraries. Although it is worth noting that all our library clients, except for one, will accept copy as found in either AACR2 or RDA. The percent of our publisher clientele asking for RDA is not quite, not quite as high. Only 24% 20, of publishers ask us to catalog in RDA. Publishers have been slower to adopt RDA and this has primarily been because library clients have been asking for it, but if they haven't been asking for it, then they haven't changed. And these are new clients that we've processed through the automated department. These are new clients that have had us enrich their records in an automated fashion over the last couple of years. So in 2013, less than half of our clients, or 43%, wanted RDA included with their processing. In 2014, that number has jumped to 89% of our clients wanting RDA included. If we step back and look at number of records enriched uh, for that same time period, the picture becomes a little bit more obvious. In 2013, 71% of the records we processed included RDA enrichment. In 2014, 98% or 11.6 million records processed included RDA. And that's just so far. Now, after our announcement in January for free RDA enrichment for existing customers, we've seen a lot of interest there as well. So far, 14 existing customers have had us enrich their records with RDAs, with the RDA service. But again, let's talk number of records. These 14 clients comprise a total of 18 and a half million bid records. So counting both existing customers and new clients, over the last two years, we have processed over 30 million bid records with our RDA enrichment service. And this processing has been done under a microscope. By and large, our clients work very closely with us on exactly what they want to see happen with the processing. Now, uh, this one slide doesn't do justice to the results we received from our December 2013 survey. At the same time, I hope it gives us a sense of what you may also be experiencing in your own library with respect to RDA. In an article that will be published very soon in the Cataloging and Classification Quarterly, Roman Panchinchin at Kent State University has included results from our survey in much more detail. The title of Roman's article is Resource Description and Access Database Enrichment, The Path to a Hybridized Catalog. And Roman called attention to us at ALA uh, in Las Vegas, so I wanted to return the favor here. As we now start talking about both the similarities and differences between automated and original cataloging at Backstage, it would probably help to know what fields automated actually considers during processing. Original cataloging does have the advantage over automated every time though. This is because the original cataloging has the actual item in hand. The automated process has to instead make uh, certain assumptions based on the presence or absence of data within the record. So now we'll look at a few comparisons. Here's our first example. 
And since I don't speak Swedish, I won't attempt to pronounce this title. Uh, here's an image of the title page and verso of this item. We'll look at the before and after comparison in just a few moments, but let's first point out the similarities between the automated RDA enrichment and the original RDA cataloging. So changes such as spelling out abbreviations, converting 260 to 264, and adding corresponding CMC fields can be handled in, in either automated processing or original cataloging. Original cataloging pulls ahead in functionality by taking advantage of the, of the item in hand. With that item, it is now okay to add the 040 subfield E RDA into the record. There may also be information that the original AACR2 mark record lacks, such as the copyright date which original cataloging can then change in the RDA record. Let's look at some other key points as we review the original AACR2 record. We've taken the liberty of showing only specific fields for these examples. Obviously other fields do exist, but for the sake of brevity we are only displaying fields that would change during the updates. So here's what the AACR2 record looks like for this title. Updates made during the automated process are in blue. We spell out abbreviations in the 300 and 504 fields. We add the corresponding best set of 33x fields with uh, subfield A, B, and 2 as desired. But uh, a couple of other points I wanted to mention. We do not add the O4OE RDA. PCC recommends that this not be added if the record is being updated via machine processing. Also, the 260 to 264 conversion can be as simple as this sometimes. Um, not always, of course, but it's surprising how much of the RDA enrichment can be intuitive. With the item in hand, we have the ability to expand upon this record even more, which you'll see in green. Using cataloger judgment, we add in the relationship designators. In this instance, there are several different terms involved just in the 100. This is one area where the machine is unable to make a good call on the appropriate relator terms. We can also add in that second 264, second indi indicator 4 with the copyright date. We can determine that this text is chiefly illustrations and add in the second 336. And with the item in hand, we are able to add the subfield E RDA into the 040 field. During the original cataloging, that second 336 field was added to the record. This was discovered by actually looking through the item itself. Our automated process, of course, did not have access to that item to consult. But also, we couldn't add this section 336 field because there was no other data in the record, such as um, 06, 07, or 300 subfield E, to warrant adding it. But we also have over a thousand rules that govern the GMB to CMC conversion. Our authorities librarian, Karen Anderson, didn't really come up for error until she felt we had addressed nearly every scenario imaginable. We're still refining it though. It can always be better as with all of our processing. Looking at another example, uh, this, this work by Peter Lang. These are images of the title page and colophon. Here's what the AACR2 record looks like. The only thing I wanted to chime in here and contribute is to say that with the previous example, the original AACR2 record did not denote the publication date as being a copyright. So there was no little C preceding the date. But the original AACR2 record of this, I'll just jump back real quick here, it does have that C. And so you can see that uh, with the automated processing, we did convert the 260 field into two separate 264 fields. And with original cataloging, here again, we can add in the appropriate relationship designators, the additional 336 because of the prevalence of images, as well as add the subfield E RDA into the 040 field. One more example, the case studies in system of systems, enterprise systems and complex systems engineering. Lots of systems. Um, here's the AACR2 record version, and we're primarily wanting to show here an example of the 245 field and the access points. So here's what this looks like. But in, as Nicole is mentioning, this example is mainly used to il illustrate the changes that could occur if you chose to have us manually update the record with the item in hand. For our automated process, we simply change the ellipses plus the et al, and I'll jump back again so you can see that. Um, we change that to and others, and essentially that's all that we do in automated. 
With the item in hand, we have access to the title page from which we can add the names of the other editors to the 245 subfield C and add them into access points with the appropriate relationship designators. We wanted to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule today to join us on this brief webinar. We hope it has been both insightful and informative. Uh, Nicole and I actually work together quite often at Backstage, so we're both grateful for this opportunity to share a little behind the scenes activities with you. And this webinar is, honestly, it's intended to be part of a short series of webinars focused on our RDA services. Future topics may include information about our wiki, uh, our online profile, planning guides, and, and style books that we use, or more examples between automated processing and original cataloging, more details on the rules we use and tables we maintain, as well as a list of things to watch out for when getting ready for RDA enrichment. Thanks, everyone.